The Cold War was the geopolitical, ideological, and economic struggle between two world superpowers, the USSR and the USA, that started in 1947 at the end of the Second World War and lasted until the dissolution of the Soviet Union on December 26, 1991. It was marked by continuous rivalry between two former World War II allies. Conflict spanned from subtle espionage in the biggest cities of the world to violent combat in the tropical jungles of Vietnam. It ranged from nuclear submarines gliding noiselessly through the depths of the oceans to the most technologically advanced satellites in geosynchronous orbits in space. In basketball and hockey, in ballet and the arts, from the Berlin Wall to the movies, the political and cultural war waged by communists and capitalists was a colossal confrontation on a scale never before seen in human history. One of the earliest events in the origin of the Cold War arose from anti-communist remarks of the British leader Winston Churchill. On March 5, 1946, in a famous speech characteristic of the political climate of the time, he stated, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe, Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere, and all are subject, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. What some historians call anti-communism, others analyze as fear, because Stalin, shortly after invading Berlin, had gone on to conquer all of Eastern Europe. The Americans responded to Stalin's maneuvers in Eastern Europe with the Marshall Plan, a generous provision of free financial aid for the reconstruction of war-torn Western Europe. The Soviets responded to the Marshall Plan with the Zhdanov Doctrine, unveiled in October of 1947. The Zhdanov Doctrine claims that the United States was seeking global domination through American imperialism, as well as the collapse of democracy. On the other hand, according to this doctrine, the Soviet Union was intent on eliminating imperialism and the remaining traces of fascism while strengthening democracy. The Americans reacted to the Zhdanov Doctrine with the so-called Long Telegram, written by George Kennan, Deputy Chief of Mission in Moscow, saying in part, Soviet power, unlike that of Hitlerite Germany, is neither schematic nor adventuristic. It does not work by fixed plans. It does not take unnecessary risks. It is impervious to the logic of reason and is highly sensitive to the logic of force. For this reason, it can easily withdraw and usually does when strong resistance is encountered at any point. Because of George Kennan and his long telegram, official US policy became the containment of communism. The Soviet Union and the United States, two nations that, outside of a few minor isolated instances, had never been enemies on any field and which had fought side by side during World War II, were now undeclared enemies in a war that would never break out in the open, but which would last for more than 50 years. When in 1949 the Soviet Union developed its first atomic bomb, the confrontation between the USA and the USSR escalated to the nuclear level, and humanity trembled at the prospect of a global nuclear catastrophe. The 1950s introduced America to one of the darkest and most illiberal ideas in political and social history. McCarthyism. The government and even private enterprise recklessly accused thousands of Americans of being communists or fellow travelers and sympathizers and subjected them to interrogation, investigation, and sanctions. The outstanding features of McCarthyism were the Hollywood blacklisting of artists and intellectuals, and the notorious hearings of the House on American Activities Committee, perhaps the most ironically named committee in the history of the United States. McCarthyism became a broad political and cultural phenomenon that ultimately tarnished the benevolent global reputation of the United States. The Cold War continued even after McCarthyism was largely exposed as paranoia and self-serving propaganda. John F. Kennedy was elected to the presidency in 1960, and shortly after, two crises erupted. In August of 1961, the USSR erected the Berlin Wall, designed to stem the increasing number of East Germans who were fleeing communist East Berlin to the West. The exact number will never be known, but perhaps as many as 200 East Germans were shot and killed trying to get over the wall. Then, in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis exploded and the world was a breath away from nuclear war. 
How close did we come? Well, during the crisis, a captain and political officer aboard one of the Soviet subs equipped with a nuclear missile came to believe a nuclear war had already begun and decided to launch their nuke against the United States. And this is where Vasily Arkhipov enters the picture, the man who probably saved the world. Vasily was made second in command on one of four attack submarines that were ordered to travel to Cuba on October 1, 1962. The sub contained 22 torpedoes, one of which was nuclear, holding the same strength as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The captains of each of the four subs were given permission to fire their nuclear torpedoes at their own discretion, so long as they had the backing of the political officer on board. Unknown to the crew of the B-59 Vasily was on, the United States began their naval blockade of Cuba on October 24 and informed the Soviets that they would be dropping practice depth charges – think warning shots – to force subs to the surface to be identified. Moscow could not communicate this information to the B-59 due to it being too deep underwater to receive radio transmissions. On the 27th of October 1962, U.S. destroyers and the aircraft carrier USS Randolph located the sub, trapped it, and began dropping depth charges to force it to surface. From this, the sub's captain, Valentin Savitsky, believed that nuclear war had already broken out between the Soviet Union and the U.S. and wanted to fire the nuclear torpedo. Fortunately, particularly given height and tensions at the time, in this case, one other person had veto power over firing besides the captain and the political officer, and that was the second in command, Vasily Arkhipov. Vasily, despite being second in command of the B-59, was the leader of the fleet of the four Soviet subs sent. Had Vasily not been present, nuclear war would have likely happened as both the captain and the political officer wanted to launch the nuclear torpedo. Vasily vehemently disagreed, arguing that since no orders had come from Moscow in a long time, such such a drastic action was ill-advised, and the sub should surface to contact Moscow. A heated argument broke out. Legend, probably false, says punches were thrown. Eventually, though, Vasily won the day. His reputation as a hero in a previous K-19 mutiny reportedly helped in the debate, and the sub surfaced. Upon meeting their American enemies, they were instructed to head back to Russia, and being exposed, they obliged. Okay, so what started the crisis in the first place? In 1959, Cuba had fallen under the leadership of Fidel Castro, who had rejected American influence to ally himself with the Soviets. In the fall of 1962, American spy planes discovered that Castro was installing Soviet nuclear missiles capable of quickly striking targets in the US. It should be noted here that the US at this time had nuclear missiles in Turkey and Italy that could hit Moscow reasonably accurately within 16 minutes of being launched. On the flip side, the Soviets had plenty of nukes pointed and perfectly capable of destroying the US's allies throughout Europe. However, the Soviets did not have nearly the capability to accurately destroy targets in the US itself. Certainly, they had enough nukes to destroy all the major cities in the US and more, but they were lacking in reliable intercontinental ballistic missiles to adequately function as a mutual destruction deterrent. Indeed, there were some among the US brass that felt the loss of allies throughout Europe and the lesser direct casualties from long-range nukes that managed to hit targets in the US was an acceptable loss given the payoff that would be the annihilation of the Soviet Union and the end of the threat to the United States. But, of course, if the Soviet Union had nukes in Cuba, that tipped the balance in the Cold War back to near even, rather than in the US's favor as before. Thus, the United States Navy blockaded Cuba, preventing Soviet deliveries of war materials. For a heart-stopping time, the world lurched towards nuclear war. Eventually, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev agreed to remove Soviet missiles on the island in exchange for the American withdrawal of equally strategically placed missiles in Turkey. From 1962 to 1975, the U.S. was involved in the war in Vietnam, where the Soviets supplied the Viet Cong with munitions, while during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan from 1979 to 1988, America supported the Afghan Mujahideen. Nevertheless, American and Soviet soldiers were never to confront one another on a field of battle. During the 1960s, the space race became a much more powerful, beneficial, and inspiring battlefield, this time for technological and ideological superiority. The Soviets took the lead on October 4, 1957, when they launched Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. They followed up by shooting the first human, Yuri Gagarin, into space in 1961, and the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova, in 1963. Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov was the first to leave his spacecraft and go for a space walk, almost getting stuck out there in the process. 
Once in orbit, Leonov strapped on an EVA extravehicular activity backpack to his spacesuit. It provided him with just 45 minutes of oxygen, which would allow him to breathe and keep cool. Meanwhile, heat, moisture, and carbon dioxide would be vented into space via a relief valve. Pavel Belyayev pressurized the inflatable airlock, which took seven minutes to fully inflate. Everything went smoothly at first, and Leonov spent a total of 12 minutes and 9 seconds out on his spacewalk. He described the experience by saying that he felt like a seagull with its wings outstretched, soaring high above the Earth. Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, and he needed to get back inside the spacecraft before he ran out of air. But getting back inside it proved to be a bit of a problem. He maneuvered himself back to the airlock, but then realized that his suit had become incredibly stiff. Due to the lack of atmospheric pressure, it had bloated with oxygen. His feet and hands had pulled away from his boots and his gloves, and he knew it was going to be incredibly difficult to get himself back inside the ship safely. There was really only one way to do it. Wriggle in head first while bleeding off the oxygen in his suit. He later stated, I knew I might be risking oxygen starvation, but I had no choice. If I did not re-enter the craft within the next 40 minutes, my life support would be spent anyway. Leonov thought about contacting Mission Control about his predicament and letting them know about the risky thing he was about to do, but decided not to. He knew that he was the only one who could do anything about the situation, and he didn't want to worry the people on the ground. As he released oxygen and exerted himself, his suit began to heat up dangerously, with his core body temperature rising 3.2 degrees Fahrenheit, 1.8 degrees Celsius, as he slowly clambered into the airlock inch by inch. Once he was finally in, he had to let even more air out so that he could curl his body around to close the hatch, which he eventually accomplished. At last, with the hatch sealed, Belyayev was able to pressurize the airlock again, and Leonov made it back inside the spacecraft after the heart-stopping few minutes of struggle. On the ground, people had watched the very first spacewalk, though Leonov's struggle to get back inside the spacecraft wasn't televised. At the first sign of trouble, the transmissions shown on televisions on Earth randomly stopped with no explanation, with most assuming technical difficulties with the broadcast feed. Leonov was thankful they didn't show his re-entry. My family was therefore spared the anxiety they would have had to endure had they known how close I came to being stranded in space. Unfortunately, that was only the start of the problems, but you can learn more about that. We did a whole series of space facts on our podcast, The Brain Food Show, which you can find. Just search your favorite podcast platform for Brain Food, one word, and you'll find it. So moving back to the Cold War. The culmination of the space race had occurred on July the 20th, 1969, when the US responded to the Soviet achievements by dropping the mic with the Apollo 11 landing on the moon and Neil Armstrong's giant leap for mankind. But it was the battles between the two nations over athletics that were perhaps the most entertaining and the most harmless as well. Except for the US boycott of the Moscow Olympics in 1980 and the corresponding Soviet boycott of the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, most sports contests had some underlying political tension but no overt political content. Two outstanding upsets, the first ever defeat of the United States in an Olympic basketball tournament in Germany in 1972, matched by the 1980 Miracle on Ice defeat of the Soviet hockey team in the Winter Olympics at Lake Placid, New York, have become legends of modern pop culture. During the 1980s, the crumbling of the economic and political structures of the Soviet Union became increasingly apparent. By 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev came to power, the Soviet Union was embroiled in disastrous economic problems. In addition, the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe were abandoning communism one after the other. In 1988, the Soviet Union abandoned its nine-year war in Afghanistan. Next, Gorbachev refused to send military support to defend the previous satellite states of the USSR, greatly weakening their communist regimes. This was the backdrop for Gorbachev's visit to East Berlin in the fall of 1989, where his speech advocating freedom of communication with the West spurred popular agitation in East Germany. Demanding reunion with their families, East Berliners pulled down parts of the wall and climbed across into West Berlin. The destruction of the Berlin Wall, of great symbolic importance, finished off the Iron Curtain, and the following year saw the reunification of Germany. That same year, the Russian Confederation convened a new Congress, electing Boris Yeltsin as president and passing laws that ousted the Soviets from Russia. This kind of political and legal instability continued throughout 1990 and 1991, as many of the Soviet republics gradually became de facto independent. Most of the Allied and pro-Soviet regimes in Eastern Europe finally collapsed, and Gorbachev wanted to end the Cold War. Horrified by these developments, in August of 1991, extremist elements among the remaining Communist Party leaders confined Gorbachev to house arrest in his dasha in the Crimea in what became known as the August Coup. 
Boris Yeltsin whipped up a violent resistance in Moscow, blockading the conspirators' military vehicles. He even persuaded the commander of a tank battalion to side with the Russians against the Soviets, at one point standing on a tank to address the crowds. The coup was suppressed, and Yeltsin was hailed as a hero. The failure of the August coup marked the end of the Soviet Union. Yeltsin entered into agreements with the leaders of other Soviet republics for dissolution of the USSR, replacing it in December of 1991 with a Commonwealth of Independent States. On December 25, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was still the highest Soviet official, officially recognized the bankruptcy and collapse of the Soviet Union. The USSR was dissolved. The extremely powerful socialist state on the Eurasian continent that had influenced world history from 1922 to 1991 disappeared forever, and the Cold War finally came to an end. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, if you enjoy videos like this, I've got another channel called Geographics where we cover certain places and periods of history. I'm going to link to that below. Check it out and subscribe if you fancy it. And thank you for watching.